Jesus. Something about that name. There's something about that name, Jesus. There really is. There's something about that name. Wow. So we saw last week where Jim did an excellent job covering too, too many scriptures, looking at the tabernacle. And we saw in the tabernacle all the pieces and the, 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 furniture, the furniture and the, uh, all the different utensils and how they were built and how they should be built and the, the casia wood and the, the wrapped with gold and we saw the mercy seat and it, you know, just all of it was so beautiful the way it was put together and as he, you know, as we went through that last week, I just kept thinking about, you know, who, I don't know who designed this sanctuary, but from the back wall to the back wall and to the sides, it's, a, it's the size of the outer court. And um, whoever designed it, I don't know if they had that in mind, but this is huge. But this was, the tabernacle was designed for God's people to be able to commune with God, to have relationship with God, to, to have uh, order about their relationship with God, to have um, very purposeful worship. And, and it was designed because the people were dysfunctional. Uh, they were complainers. They were whiners. They were... Uh, they just found no ability to be content with life or with, with the Lord. They just complained, 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 and complained. And God chose Abraham. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. He chose Abraham. And through Abraham, he was going to build a nation. Now, this nation that God was going to build did not become a nation until Moses departed from Egypt. And in the process of passing through the wilderness, God establishes the Mosaic Covenant, and in it, he establishes the nation of Israel. And in the nation of Israel, he sets order, and he sets law and rules, and boundaries, and the people were rebellious. He's, the Lord said they were stiff-necked. They were complainers. They were, uh, everyone did what they pleased and that they thought was right in their own eyes. And so the law was put in place to show them how dysfunctional they are. And in the dysfunction was this established law that had consequences. And the consequences to show Israelites that God is a God of law, order, and justice. He's a God of rules. He's a God of, of uh, righteousness and holiness. And they needed to see that God was a God to fear. That his justice was certainly something to fear, but we also saw through the book of Exodus that God is a God of love. He's a God of faithfulness. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of, of grace. And so this, this God that loves Israel has to set and establish a, a boundary for them. Because if, if God was just a God of love, then he would let his children just get away with anything. And eventually they would get away with murder. And, and you know, there's a lesson to be learned with, with raising our children. Uh, parents, there's a, there's a movement with parents today, and that is, I'm going to be my kid's friend. Um, it's nice to have uh, your kids as a friend, but the problem with that is, they need a parent. And, um, you know, well, I never spanked my kid. Um, I think God was pretty smart in making them fear the Lord because fearing the Lord is what made them repent. It, it was made them, it's what made them fall on their face and cry mercy. Um, 
and so God really gives us a beautiful picture of holiness, righteousness, and, and justice wrapped in love. And as we see the Lord building this tabernacle and laying out the order for the tabernacle, we begin to see that God has a order to him. But we're going to see something else about his order, and we're going to look at that tonight. And as we were looking at the tabernacle, we saw the outer court, the inner court, or the holy place, and then the, the holy of holies was where the mercy seat was. So as you go in to the, whole, the outer court, it's where you brought your sacrifice, and you laid it on the, on the altar, and it, was, it had spikes on it, and sometimes you'd spike it down, and you'd set it on fire, and you'd burn it as a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. And it was your sacrifice to the Lord. And the, the reason why there had to be a sacrifice is because there had to be death to cover your sin. And so you'd go in and you present your, your sacrifice to the priest, and they would begin the process. And then as you go into the holy place, there's a, a laver who, where you wash, you, you bathe. But you don't get in it like a bathtub and you don't bathe your whole body. You, you clean your feet and your hands. And the priests would have to clean themselves to go into the holy place. And once they cleaned themselves, once their hands and their feet were clean, they can go into the holy place with holy garments on. They'd have to wear whole holy garments. And once they enter into that room there would be a lampstand that would give light to a place that was, and we saw last week how it was built, how thick it was, and the badger skins, and all this stuff that would cover this tabernacle, so there was absolutely no presence of light inside of it. It was total darkness. And so this light, that the lampstand was built out of pure gold, pure gold, it was, it was a picture of pure holiness, pure deity, the picture of the light stand. And in that room also was the, the showbread table. And the showbread table uh, would present the 12 loaves of bread, and uh, there were pretty large loaves of bread that was in that room. And in that room before the veil, there was an incense table where they would burn incense. And the light would be lit 24-7, and the incense would be burning 24-7, and the bread would be baked every, every, uh, every six day, and it would be prepared and put out there, and every seven days they'd replace the bread. And then there would be the veil. It separated everyone from the presence of God. And the veil was six inches thick, and only the high priest could go behind the veil once a year on the Day of Atonement to bring in the sacrificial blood of the animal. And he would bring the blood into the, the Holy of Holies, behind the veil, into the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. The presence of God was in that Holy of Holies. And in there was the Ark of the Covenant. There, was, there would be the Ark of the Covenant there would be Aaron's rod who had been butted. In that, in that ark was, was the, the, all that Christ was. All that Christ was was in that ark. And so you had the law in there. And the, in the law was in there. And in this uh, acacia box that was covered in gold inside and out was a mercy seat with cherubim on top of it covering the mercy seat. And the, the blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. Wow. Now back up. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. God comes because animals can't take away man's sin. It can only cover it so God can have a relationship with us. But the animal's blood can never remove the sin. So Ever since Adam and Eve up till Jesus Christ, 
everybody's sin was never removed. Everybody had sin. Everyone who ever existed since Adam and Eve had sin still judging them. And so there had to be a remedy for everyone who believed since Adam and Eve were given the promise of the seed, Jesus Christ, back in the garden. They were given the promise. And the belief in the promise is what, how they gained their salvation. And all through the Old Testament, all the prophets told of Jesus Christ, who was salvation, the Messiah, the Christ. It was their salvation. And that was how they gained their ability to be saved. Not by the blood of animals. Not by keeping the law. Now they lost sight of that along the way. They began to believe that the law would save them. The law would protect them. But it never could. It never would. It was an animal that died. And it was the law that kept them guilty. The law convicted them, convicted them. The law was always judging them. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. So what Jesus comes to the outer court. He comes to the world, the outer court. And he, he's, he's laid out in the outer court. He's laid out in the world and crucified. And they shed the Lamb of God's blood. Jesus' blood is shed. And when the, the blood of Christ was, was poured out on that day at Golgotha on that hill, Outside the city, some beautiful things happen. God was pleased with a human sacrifice that paid for human sin. God was pleased. Wonderful. So when you go into the Holy of Holies, remember in the upper room, Jesus said to Peter, he says, you only need your feet and your hands clean because you're already clean. That's that laver. The priests go and they wash their hands and feet before they go into the holy place. You know, you, you just need to wash the dirt from the world off of you. you I've already saved you, your life. Now, why was Aaron's life already saved? Because he believed in the coming Messiah. He had his salvation. Christ had not died yet and Christ had not paid for his sin yet, but his faith it was what held him, held him in God's protection and saved him. Remember um, when, uh, who was it? Abraham. And God said to Abraham that, uh, that his, his righteousness came from his faith. He believed on God and God accounted his faith as righteousness. And his faith was in the seed, the promise of Christ to come through his son, Isaac, and then Jacob, and the children of Israel. And Jesus would come from Abraham because it was, that's why that, the, the nation of Israel, that's why their, their seed was so protected. God didn't want them to mix. He wanted to keep that blood pure because one day out of, G, out of Israel would come the Messiah. And so God said to Abraham, because you believed in the Messiah, I count that as righteousness to you. You're saved. Wow. Now, Abraham was saved 400 years before the law even came into existence. 400 years before Moses. So the law didn't save Abraham. His faith saved him. So you see this tabernacle and you go to the labor, it's a picture of, of our ability to keep ourselves spotless from the stain of the world. Now you go into the tabernacle, and what is in there? The lampstand that burns 24-7 in a place of darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the light of the world, and the world is darkness. The Bible clearly tells us that the world is in darkness, and Jesus is the only true light. He tells us that. He's the only true light, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world, 
And if you look at John chapter 1, it talks about Jesus being the light of the world. And so he's the light of the world. You have the lampstand. It's Jesus, the light of the world, that shines in darkness. The lampstand. And then you have the showbread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. He's the bread of life. You get the incense. The incense is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. What does Jesus do? It says that he prays for us. He prays for you constantly. He lives to make intercession for you. There's the incense coming up to the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praying for me every day. Sweet smelling aroma. My, my, my Lord prays for me. Jesus prays for me. Isn't that crazy? Jesus prays for me. When you think nobody else is praying for you, Jesus is praying for you. And there's the incense burning. But then there's the veil. And the veil was saying, you can't come to the Father. None of the Israelites, only the high priest, only once a year could come into the Holy of Holies. And so the veil was saying, you can't come to the Father because you're, you're unclean. And so Jesus blocks our ability to come to the Father until he lays down his life and dies for our sin. Now, once Jesus dies pays for our sin and raises from the grave and, and conquers that sin that once held us and kept us from God, once that happened, it says that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. When they tore his flesh, the Lord opened the door for the world to come to the Father, the whole world to come to the Father. And when they came to the Father, the beautiful thing is when you walk into the presence of God and you acknowledge that it was the blood of Christ that brought you into the Holy of Holies, when you acknowledge that it was Christ's blood on God's mercy for you, the mercy seat, and when you realize you come into the Holy of Holies, it was Christ's blood that let you in there, and it was the mercy of God that accepted the blood of Christ, then you realize that that mercy seat contains the fulfillment of the law in Christ. Christ fulfilled the law for you. So you, you can't keep it. He can, and he fulfilled the law. And you have, uh, you know, the manna that's in the ark, the picture that God will always provide for you, always, constantly, forever and ever. He'll care for you forever, for all of eternity. He will care for you. And so that whole entire tabernacle was Jesus Christ. The whole thing was Jesus, all of it. Every bit of it was Jesus Christ. God tried to show it to them. They were thick-headed. They were stubborn. Have you ever known somebody in your life that you've tried to share all the beauty of Christ with? You try to just explain to them how precious it is, how wonderful it is, how amazing it is, how incredible it is, and they say, yeah, but no thank you. No thank you. I got another way. I got another way. Or maybe they're just religious. Yeah, but I got my religion. And that's what the, the Jews had. They had their religion. And they thought their religion could save them, but it couldn't. Only Christ could save them. So we get to chapter 31, and it opens up, and it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezel, the son of Uri." the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver, to work in bronze, in cutting jewel, jewels, 
for settings, carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. Now, this is after uh, the Lord told Moses all about all the, the furnishings. He goes on to talk about how he's going to have the people equipped to do all this work with Moses. Verse 6 says, And I, indeed I, have appointed with him Aholab and his son Ahasamar of the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in the heart of all the gifted artists, um, artisans that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its basin, the garments of ministry, the holy garments for Aaron, the priest, and the garments of his sons, the ministers as priests, and the anointing oil, the sweet incense for the holy place. According to all that I commanded you, they shall do. So God, in the last, since uh, when uh, Pastor Jim teach, taught last week up to this point, we see that God has sent people that are qualified, that are craftsmen, that are uh, able to oversee this work that he's given Moses. And he provides all this detail. It's interesting how these guys weren't up on the mountain seeing the blueprint. But it's, it's very clear that God showed Moses. So he must have had a, like an overhead projector and just laid the whole thing out. And he said, listen, I got gifted people, artisans, and they're going to do, do it just like that. See, Moses, I want it just like that. Wow. So Moses really had to be hands-on in the whole project. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. The seventh day, the Sabbath, you shall keep. Surely, surely my Sabbath you shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies. I am the Lord who's able to save your rebellious soul. You shall keep the Sabbath before, you shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. I remember saying that God has a side to him that's full of justice, righteousness, holiness. He has order. He has law. He has things set. And he lays it out. It's not like God just smokes them for being bad. He tells them how to be good first. And he's serious. God is serious. Now, there's something you're going to see here that's really awesome about God's serious law. Fifth, verse 15 says, Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of, re Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. The Sabbath is holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wow. Any work. It's the Sabbath is a holy day to the Lord. So God wanted the Israelites to take one day and dedicate that day to the Lord. The whole day to the Lord. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. 
to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. Perpetual. That's something that just keeps on keeping on. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and and, uh, was refreshed. And when he had made an end of the sprinkling with with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the Lord's finger, the finger of God, verse uh, chapter 32. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed, now he gives them two tablets, and it was written on the tablets with God's finger. Now, when you get to chapter 32, now check out the people. And he received the gold. Wait, no, back up. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Because he's been up there quite a while. And so they're like, you know, Aaron... And and who's Aaron? He's one of the leaders. He's one of the holy leaders of God. So they go to Aaron and say, hey, listen, this Moses guy, we don't know what happened to him, but we need a God. So we need you to make us a God. And Aaron said to them, no way. I'll never do such a thing. God is holy and righteous. Why would I ever do such a thing? Oh, that's not in there. Oh, never mind. (laughs) <laughs> and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, in, your, in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron, and he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it. He fashioned it. Wow. Wow with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Listen carefully. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and he molded a calf. Then they said, this is our God. This is your God, O Israel. Now, Aaron is supposed to know better. Has he not seen the hand of God move in in Egypt? Has he not seen the hand of God move on the Red Sea? Has he not seen the hand of God bring water out of a rock? Has he not seen God provide meals for them every single day? Wow. Bring me the gold and I'll make your calf. I'll I'll fashion it, I'll engrave it, and I'll mold a calf for you. So when Aaron saw it, He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Verse 6, Then they rose early on the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. These are the people that God led by the the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke, and he got him across the Red Sea. He destroyed the whole Egyptian army. He brought all the plagues on Egypt. He provided for them. Wow. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Get down, for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, you got to picture Moses up on the mountain. He's on the mountain with who? God. I don't know if you can comprehend what what that means when it says he was with God. God. The great I am. The all-sufficient one. The almighty. God himself. 
God, he's with God on the mountain, and God's given him this incredible task, and God's laying it out, he's showing it to him. They're having this great time up there. He was up there a long time with God. And God's talking to him, and this is, and he's like this, wow, this is awesome. And then God says, get down, you, your people are get, go, really going off. It's like, <laughs> wow, we were having a good time. Oh, no. Can you imagine Moses? Get down. Go get down for your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They're saying that this calf brought them out of the land of Egypt. How does God feel? Wow. Wow. It's pretty bad. It's a bad situation. They've turned aside quickly. How quickly they forgot their God. How impatient do we get sometimes? We don't want to wait for God, so we're going to fix it. We don't want to wait for God. We're going to fix this. We're going to take care of this. Didn't Abraham's wife do that? He didn't, she didn't want to wait for God. She was going to fix the situation. And what came forth? Ishmael. Ishmael came forth. And what, did it, what was Ishmael? Ishmael became the whole Islamic nation, came from Ishmael. And what kind of a problem did the Jews have with, have with Islam? They're still having a problem with Islam. Sometimes we want to fix things for God instead of being patient and seeing what God has in store. God has something special in store. He was building them a tabernacle where they could dwell with him. They couldn't wait for that. Be patient. God might have something special. Maybe that's why you're not, you haven't got it yet. There's something special coming. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and indeed, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone. God says, now, therefore, Moses, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and I will make of you a great nation. Moses, I'm going to start over with you. I'm going to just annihilate them. I'm just going to start over with you, Moses. Then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God. I love that. The Lord, then Moses pleaded with the Lord, his God. I love that. His God. And said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? He's reminding the Lord, not that the Lord forgot. With great power and with a mighty hand, why should the Egyptians speak and say, he brought them out to harm them, to kill them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your, fa your, turn your fierce wrath, turn from your fe fierce wrath and relent from this harm to your people. Then Moses says, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of to give to your descendants. And they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14, so the Lord relented from his harm, which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain. And the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. The tablets were written on both sides, one on one side 
and on the other, they were written. Now, the Lord relented from his harm. Does that mean that we can tell God what to do, that we can make him change his mind? Or is it, or is it that God has a standard and his standard is, is true, it's righteous, it's holy, and his judgment is, is sure. He has a sure judgment. And here he is letting Moses know that this is out of my order and it deserves justice. It deserves justice. And then Moses, this beautiful picture of Christ, intercedes for God's people. And God relents. What, what does it mean when God relents? It means God is merciful. That, my, that means that God is gracious. It means that God is a God of love. Yes, he's a God of justice, and yes, he can destroy them. He has every right to destroy them, yet he's a God of mercy. He's a God of love. He's a God who's compassionate. All through the scriptures, you see the compassion of God, and God was compassionate, and with compassion, God did this, and God was merciful. Look at the Psalms. It's loaded with God's merciful. God is merciful. God, his mercy is anew every day. He's a merciful God, but he's a just God. He has every right to judge them. He has every right to cast punishment on them. Yet he has every right to be merciful. And Moses turned and went down from the mountain, and the two tablets of the testimony were in his hand. They're written on both sides. Verse 16, now the tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. And when Joshua heard the noise, here is Moses coming down the mountain. He's got the tablets, and Joshua is with him. And Joshua hears this noise of the people, as, and they're shouting. Remember, remember they, they ate and they drank and they rose up to play? Well, they're coming down the mountain. They're hearing this, this noise. And Joshua says... He says to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. See, I guess Joshua didn't hear the Lord say that they built a calf, but, but Moses did hear that. God told Moses, get down, they're building a calf to worship. So Joshua says, it sounds like war in the camp. And then Moses says, it's not a noise, uh, it's not the noise of the shout of victory, nor is it the noise of the cry of defeat, but it is the sound of singing I hear. So it was, as soon as, uh, as he came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, so Moses, in anger, became hot. And he cast ta the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf which they had made, burned it in the fire and ground it into powder and he cast it, he scattered it on the water and made the children of Israel drink it. Now, Moses is an 80-year-old man. What is it that made them allow him to ruin their calf? They had some kind of fear of Moses, for sure. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do that you have brought this great sin upon them? Like, Aaron, what did they do to you for you to be able to come to this place in your mind where you're going to destroy them? What did they, what were you thinking? So Aaron said, check this out. Do not let the anger of the Lord become hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. You know those people. Remember the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned, right? And Moses, and, and I mean, Adam was there, and, and God called them out. 
You know, and, and what did what did Abraham, what did uh, Adam say to the Lord? That woman you gave me. Yeah, that's what he said. That woman you gave me. And Aaron's doing the same thing. Those people, you know those people. You know how they are. They're always doing evil. Verse 23, for they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. And I cast it into the fire, and this calf came out. <laughs> For real. This is what he says. <laughs> this is Aaron. Can you believe it? This is Aaron. He's supposed to be a straight-up guy. He's supposed to be one of the, the big dudes. I threw the gold into the fire, and this calf came out. Poor Moses. He must have just was like, <sighs> verse 25, now when Moses saw that the people were uh, unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies, wow, to their shame among their enemies, so I get the impression, because this the language that's being used here, I get the impression that the people that didn't approve of the Israelites must have been at a distance checking out what they're doing. And he's going, look what you guys did in their presence. Look what you did. You showed them that you got the stupid gold calf that you got. And you're showing them that you rebelled against your true living God. And, and so he's saying... What are you thinking? I wonder if we do that sometimes for people who are watching us as Christians and then we do things that are not of faith. You know, we're, we're, we're whimpering. We're, we're not believing. We're, we're panicking. We're, we're flipping out. We got anxiety going on. And we keep telling them that God is everything and God is, you know, he provides all of our needs and, and God is our protector and our defender and he's our provider and he's our counselor and we act like zombies in front of our enemies. I wonder if we do that. It's possible. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. He didn't say whoever's on my side. He said, whoever's on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother, every man kill his companion, every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of, the, of Moses. And about 3,000 men of the children of Israel, the people, fell that day. 3,000. 3,000 fell that day. I thought God was merciful. I thought God was loving. I thought God relented. He relented from killing three, three million. But there was going to be bloodshed. And there was going to be a lesson learned. And there was going to be a consequence for the sake of three million. For the sake of three million. He's a God of justice. He's a God of righteousness. A God of holiness. He's righteous and true. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's loving. But you got to just, you can't mess with God. He's for real. He's a God of justice. The best thing we could ever do is just cry out for mercy. And when we cry out for mercy, what are we crying out for? Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is my mercy. Jesus is my grace. I, you know, it says when we accept Jesus Christ into our life, it says that we're clothed with the righteousness of Christ. He puts his garment on us. He puts that white 
garment on us and we're clothed in righteousness. He's my grace. He's my mercy. He's my righteousness. He's my all. Jesus is it. The whole ball of wax. Praise the Lord. Or we'd all be smoked. Verse 29, then Moses said, consecrate yourselves today, today to the Lord that he may bestow on you a blessing this day for every man has opposed his son and his brother. Now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, so now I will go up to the Lord, perhaps, perhaps, I can make atonement for your sin. Perhaps. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sins, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. If you will forgive their sins, well, praise God. But if you won't, take me instead. Isn't that amazing? That's the picture of Jesus. Take me. Let them live. Take me. And Moses is the picture of Christ so perfectly. If, if you could forgive their sins, great. But if not, take me. Take me. I'll take the punishment. Verse 33, and the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Now, therefore, go. Lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my, my uh, angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, visit for my punishment, I will, vi I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. So the Lord plagued the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron made. Wow. Wow. Remember at least three times the children of Israel promised, promised that they were going to do everything the Lord said. Everything. Exodus 19, which we saw already in days past, verse 8. Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the word of the people to the Lord. All that the Lord has said, we will do. In Exodus 24, verse 3, it says, so, so Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, the rules. And it says that, and all the people, not some of them, all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, what? We will do. Exodus 24, verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said... All that the Lord has said, we will do and be what? Obedient. So, they have, a, they have a rough road ahead of them. It's been, they're going to have a long road to travel because of their inability to trust God. And that's what it boils down to, their inability to trust God. It, it, that's disobedience. Disobedience is your inability to trust God. That's what it is. Everything that the Lord has laid out for the children of Israel was to protect them. If, you know, if they would just trust the Lord, all would go well. You know, that journey that took them 40 years should have only taken two months. It took 40 years. They even came to the, 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 the border of the promised land 
And they, they were like, oh, we can't go in there. There's giants. And the Lord said, okay, we'll go back in the wilderness. Trust the Lord. You know, Proverbs 3, 4, and 5, uh, chapter 3, uh, 5, and 6 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And it says this, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. That's a great scripture because that's the truth. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. We don't have good understanding. You know, you might think you're a genius, but really you're not. Well, I took a test and they said I was a genius. I'm talking spiritually. You're not a genius. I'm not a genius. We're not geniuses when it comes to spirituality. We're in great need of a guide. We need someone to lead us through this world spiritually. We need someone to lead us through this world. And it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all of your ways. And there's a, there's a reward. He'll direct your path. He'll make your pathway straight. He'll, he'll get you to the other side. He'll lead you. You know, the Bible tells us that we're sheep. He describes God's people as sheep. And the thing about sheep is the shepherd leads the sheep. He doesn't drive the sheep. He leads the sheep. And where does he lead the sheep? In the path of righteousness for his namesake. He leads them in the path of righteousness. All we have to do is trust in the Lord with all our heart, lead not on our own understanding, acknowledge him in all his ways, and he leads us in the path of righteousness. He makes it work. Why does he make it work? For his name's sake. Why does he make it work? Because he wants the best for us. Why does he make it work? Because people are watching us, and he wants us to be a good witness. So he's... All we, we have to do is trust him, and he's going to make it work. It's a great verse. All right, so next week we will pick it up at verse chapter 33. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Your word is excellent. Excellent. Father, and you have a beautiful way of showing us your character. You have a beautiful way of showing us your mercy, your love your grace, but you also have a very serious way of showing us your standards and who you are. You're holy, you're righteous and true. Lord, I am grateful for your mercy, which was poured out on Calvary's mountain, where your dear precious son was nailed to a tree and shed his blood for me and for all of us. So Lord, we are going to be blessed beyond measure in knowing how merciful you have been with us and how your grace has been poured out in our hearts in abundance. So Lord, help us to live that way. Help us to live like we believe it. We give you all glory tonight and honor. Lord, if there's any of us that feel as though we need to lay something at your altar, to lay something at your feet, to leave it there and walk away from it, if there's something we need to put down at your feet, uh, Father, just hear our hearts as we surrender to you this evening. Lord, we, uh, we want to follow you. We want you to lead us, Lord, so uh, we lay it all down at your feet. We walk by faith, not by sight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.